I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight. He's the founder and head of Jam Inc., which manages rock legends like The Doors, Ramones, and the estates of Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Otis Redding, Peter Tosh, and Rick James, among others. Now, he does a lot, so I'm gonna be in my notes for a second, because I don't want to get it wrong. He is a Grammy winner for the 2009 Doors theatrical documentary film, When You're Strange. He also produced the hit Broadway musical, A Night with Janis Joplin. He's a professor at UCLA's Music Business and Entertainment Studies and has been involved with that program's curriculum for 15 years. People speak very highly of you, Jeff, over there. And he's also a former governor of the LA chapter of the Recording Academy, a title I hold dear. So please welcome Jeff Jampol. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, you guys. Um, thanks for having us tonight. Thanks for being here with us. This is obviously a subject very near and dear and true to my heart. Uh, and I'm obviously biased. So I'm going to try and get uh, some of my, biased, uh, my co-biasers up here. Um, first, I want like to introduce um, Janice Joplin's sister, Laura Joplin, who came all the way in and out of town to be here. Hello to everyone. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for the traveling to come see us. Uh, next up, Janis Joplin's brother, Michael Joplin. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Michael, for traveling as well. Uh, and last but certainly not least, our awesome, amazing, wonderful director of our documentary, Amy Berg. Thank you, Amy, for coming. Of course, I wouldn't miss this. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I want to start just by telling you um, a little bit about the journey, because I think the journey is a large part of this documentary. This was a labor of love, really, between the four of us for over seven years, wasn't it? Um, and I first met Amy. It turned out we knew each other from a past life, which was really great. But when we talked about uh, Filmmaking, we talked about music, we talked about art, uh, and specifically we talked about Janice. And I, and I realized very quickly that Amy had a, a, an amazing point of view and a point of entry and a way to present Janice in a way where the viewer would be able to experience Janice as an artist, as a human being, her soulfulness, what drove her, what motivated her, and really kind of peel back the layers and understand the soul of an artist and a human and a woman. And I think we all related to that. And so we all kind of bonded with Amy very quickly and we took this journey together, um, obviously way beyond any financial return or any hopes of anything. I mean, this was a labor of love the whole way. It actually, the film did very, very well. Um, and I'm very happy and grateful for that. But I want to start with you, Amy, because I kind of want to talk about the point of view because it's such, uh, it, I think it will illuminate, start to illuminate who Janice is and, and then we'll kind of fill in. Well, um, okay, I think that in our first meeting, Laura had shared some letters with me. That there were all these letters that existed that um, were, some were in your book and some were not in your book, and they just gave this kind of very personal, sensitive side of this woman who was larger than life on stage. And the thing that got me the most um, and, became, and became kind of an obsession for me was this story between Janice and David Niehaus and the song Crybaby, which, which basically comes from this relationship in a way. And it was just this kind of tragic ending for Janice. It was a tragic tale because Janice and David were in love. She wasn't, I guess, together enough at the time when they were in their relationship to be able to kind of give up drugs for good. Um, and But just the fact that he was, she was planning on meeting him at the end of her life and that he had sent this telegram to her hotel that she did not receive because she passed away that night. And it just, it broke my heart. So I, I went and sat with my editor and put this piece together um, with Crybaby at the center of it. And I showed it to them. And I was like, this is the story I want to tell. And, um, and then we just kept meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting and so yeah it's just and then and then things went away and then they came back it was it was quite a journey um but the letters to me 
showed the human. They showed this woman who was, you know, she was a she was a young girl inside. She was trying to, you know, she was trying to break through in a man's world. The music business, you know, obviously has changed quite a bit over the years, but it was, you know, so male dominated at the time. And she was just this fragile being that was more powerful than any other woman at the time and kind of the first female rock star in a way. And I just, I really related to her struggle and I just, I felt like I had to tell the story, so. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. It's, you know, for me, I realize that any one of us is not really a statistically significant sample. Um, but one of the things that I try and do as a human being as well as, as a professional and a manager is when I, I'm working with an artist, I really want to get, I really want to understand that artist as a human being and where they're coming from and what their motivations are and what it felt like. That's what it felt like to be the artist, what it felt like to be a member of the audience, what it felt like to experience that and to go, you know, the first initial reaction you have is, oh my God, look, listen to her voice, look at that woman move, listen to her sing, and, and like that's where it starts. But for me, what intrigued me when we first started working together, and I want to get into this a little bit with her, bat, with her upbringing, um, was here is this woman who, uh, I mean, she wore her heart on her sleeve. You know, she, she wanted love and acceptance. She made no bones about talking about it. She was one of the most vulnerable people I've, I've ever really experienced. I never met Janice, so I experienced it all after her passing and through her music and letters and, and what she said and, and her on film and in writing. Um, but the thing that really struck me was in a time way before any kind of beginnings of gender parity, uh, in a time when it was a man's world, this woman who wanted love and acceptance and wore her heart on her sleeve never ever, ever compromised her vision to, to win, to get it. And I think that a lot of times as humans, I can't, I can't understand what it's like as a woman, I'm not one, but just as a human, we're constantly forced to compromise our vision, you know, or to whore ourselves out in different ways. Well, I'll do this for this boss even though it's not right because I want the paycheck. Or I'll do this for this girl even though it's not right because I want this relationship, right? What, whatever it may be. And, and Janice, in my eyes, never, ever, ever compromised her vision. And in so doing, completely shattered the glass ceiling, beat every guy at their game, and ruled that world. And, and that's what blew me away. And I want to talk a little bit about um, her, uh, your guys' upbringing together in Port Arthur, um, some of the stories I've heard, especially about segregation, especially about how you know, when she went to listen to live music. And I want to kind of start there. Maybe you can fill it in what, what, and what, what it was like. Well, our parents were Yankees, and we <laughs> lived in southeast Texas. So we were set up to have a slightly different perspective, and racial integration was a discussion in the household. And from my perspective, that was uh, one of the beginning of the, all the problems that Janice had is that she stood up in social studies class and said that she thought uh, racial segreg segregation was wrong. And from that class, she had uh, guys hounding her, throwing pennies at her, yelling her, at her. And from that class to the day she graduated from high school, it just got worse. And I remember our parents, my father would, would tell me that I have tried to get her to just adjust a little in the way she deals with these people. And, you know, she just wasn't going to do it. And, you know, on the one hand, you feel the, the righteousness of her doing that. But at the same time, you do kind of, I think, as an adult and a parent, you know, wish that she might have made life a little easier for herself. Uh, because, you know, if they were pushing, she was pushing back. <laughs> mm -hmm. and Michael, uh, I want to look at the other side of that, of, the, uh, of, of how you guys grew I know for me, my older siblings turned me on to rock and roll. They turned me on to blues. They turned me on to music. And I, I, obviously, I know some of your experiences, but I want to talk about kind of discovering the world through your older sister's eyes a bit. Um, uh, sure, I, I have to start though. Our parents were not Yankees, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Relatively I, I speaking, really they were. That. That, North Texas. Uh, yeah, North Texas. <laughs> 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 right, so. Nebraska. I just want to clarify that. I'm uh, hardcore on that one. Uh, 
uh, growing up with music, our parents, first, I, to talk about that, our parents were, uh, my mother, our mother wanted to be a Broadway show tune girl, you know, that was her passion. Uh, so she was really into popular music, and our father was very into classical music, and they taught us the love of music. And I just remember, I, w I walked into the living room one day, my dad's listening to Cole Nidre, the Rachmaninoff Cole Nidre thing, and he's just weeping. And I was like, wow, that, that music can do that to you. You know, I just remember that. And I'm sure he taught that to Laura as well as Janice, that type of uh, passion for sound and, uh, so, and art as well. So we were all turned on by that. Um, and the, uh, the music at the time was really quite different, obviously. And when we were starting to listen to rock and roll, it was so terrifying to our parents, you know. That, I remember Pop telling me that the Beatles, wow, you know, just as horrible, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, but we had a lot of blues around. I remember Janice listening to folk music, and you know, so that was uh, my early upbringing was really into the blues, though. That's what I remember in high school listening to. Right, and, and, and what about those trips across state lines? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about them? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> We lived close to Louisiana, and I know Janice had done it, and, uh, but I went to my first concert. I was probably 14, something like that, and uh, it was at a bar, and you could drink because they didn't care. And, uh, but I remember walking into this all-white bar, and this really tall, skinny, black guy with a purple velvet uh, tuxedo got up and started you know, with big wild hair started playing. So it was Little Richard at my first concert in some little <laughs> bar in, wow. in Louisiana. And I'm like, watching this white crowd, how they were like, this is like Ku Klux Klan neighborhood. Okay. And they're rocking and rolling to this guy, you know? And so this blur happened in my vision, you know, where was that? and how different it had been for Janice, different for you, different from our parents, but that blur was already starting to happen. It wasn't quite as, they might have killed him outside in the parking lot, but they were gonna rock and roll with him at that time. So it was a, I loved that blur. That right. And clearly, I mean, she, as Laura talked about, she was an outsider from the very beginning, right? And she wasn't backing down for anybody. Well, you know, I, I've reflected a lot on this, and I keep trying to find the roots and the structure and stuff. And, and one of the things I remembered is that in the third grade, Janice's teacher told Mother that Janice had a, an ability to draw. And so Mother signed her up for private art lessons. And so immediately from the third grade on, Janice became skilled at drawing and she was then identified in school as an artist. So by the time she got to high school, she was out on her own, you know, sketching all over town, learning how to look at different buildings, to look at the sailboats out on the, the bay. Uh, she was practicing an independent lifestyle that her peers didn't do because they didn't have that hobby. And so when she got in high school, she was a beatnik because beatniks were artists and they were her people, you know. So she, um, for very innocent reasons, you know, became identified as someone who was different and, and loved the state line clubs, loved the state line clubs. And there's a lot of good music. One, one of the things that's fun to know is that from New Orleans all the way over to Houston with Port Arthur kind of in the middle, uh, there's a bunch of uh, rock and rhythm and blues and blues clubs that would winter there because there were some really good recording studios that recorded them. So the state line clubs right uh, on the border with Louisiana and Texas had the pick of the people that you would want to listen to when it was not touring season. Wow. It's uh, very special. All right. And, and she, so she gets out of there, she goes to college, right, University of Texas. She's already having some problems fitting in, already feeling a little bit adrift, maybe, and trying to figure out her way. And I kind of want to, I want to turn to you, Amy, and, and talk about, I'm so fascinated, 
I, w I was and am so fascinated by the process of you discovering Janice through the process of making of this film because in you I kind of saw me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in that I kind of see everybody. So I, I want to talk about your process and what you discovered and what you felt and, and talk about Janice's time through college and then right after. And then we're going to talk about San Francisco. Uh, yeah, I mean, those fragile moments just broke my heart. I felt so protective of Janice the whole time. I mean, I felt like you just hear what happened to her at college and you just picture this beautiful woman walking around with no shoes on, trying to like, you know, perform and entertain and learn art and be part of the community. And, you know, for a fraternity to vote her the ugliest man on campus is like, you know, it's, I, it, I, there's no way she ever recovered from that scar. It's just impossible for that kind of, uh, you know, that's, that's well, that, something that stayed with her forever. That for moment sure. in the film, right, right. where um, uh, Powell, St. John, is yeah, talking yeah, about it, he starts to tear up, and I, I tear up every time I, I watch know, that, and my I heart know. breaks. It's they, 50 years ago, too, and he's it. sitting there crying. Oh, my God. They all yeah. loved her so much, and they, that's, that's one thing that I thought was really powerful in my process of going through this, you know, this journey of talking to her old peers and her bandmates is that Janice definitely burned some bridges, you know, along the way. Obviously, she was so honest and she always spoke up. But the love did not die, even from Country Joe, who was like my least favorite person interviewing in the film because he was so grumpy. Country Joe McDonald from Country yeah, yeah, Joe yeah. and the Fish. He was so grumpy and just like, had he, did, he had like, a chip on his shoulder still all these years later, but he still loved her. You still could see the love, and they all had this flame for Janice, no matter what happened. But, I mean, I think that the greatest sense that I could get from Janice was from the guys in Big Brother. I mean, they were just so... They were honest, beautiful, no matter how... I, their whole career was affected by her leaving the band, obviously. I mean, they right. never really recovered from that. But they still just really, really gave me such an insight into Janice. Um, I'm sorry, we jumped ahead. We were talking about the fragile moments from her college years. Um, I mean, just the fact that she had the strength to, she almost had the strength to tell your parents that she was leaving. She kind of chickened out on that one. That's a great story, actually. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess you guys have probably seen the film, so I can be repetitive. I should mention, too, that if you have not seen the film, I believe it's going to be streaming uh, and available on the Grammy.com and Grammy Pro sites for a while. So uh, all members of the Grammys will have access to watch the whole film at no, at no cost. Right. And it's also on Netflix. I think it's still on Netflix right now. So It is, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but just, I mean, she just, I think that she would take all the pain that she experienced and just push it into her music and it kept driving her forward so if you want to get to San Francisco I mean these fragile moments that were that she experienced in college just got her straight out to California and she knew that when she got there that was her home so she found a way to turn this sadness into strength and that is something that I think she had throughout her whole life I mean with every sad experience she had yep you watch it time and time again before we move forward and head north uh, I just wanted to open up if there's any questions from the audience about this stage of Janice's career or any questions you have for her brother or sister or Amy. If not, we're going to move forward. Just where, where did Janice fit in age-wise? Uh, she was the eldest. Was she the, she, uh, the no. oldest. I'm the baby, middle Janice. I think there's six years difference and eight years difference. Is that it? Ten yeah. years from Janice to Michael. Okay. And, um, right. Okay. So... Uh, so now Janice is in San Francisco. She has one short bout in San Francisco and it kind of comes home with her tail between her legs. And, uh, and that was kind of a sad moment for me, to t for me to watch as well because I watched this like flamingo that wanted to bloom and, and it just didn't work out and she came home back to Port Arthur after living in San Francisco kind of with her tail between her legs and really underwent this, um, this real... Uh, this really college try to just live straight. And there's pictures of her after San Francisco in this beehive hairdo and conservative dresses. And uh, I, I just want to know what, what the reaction was in your household when she returned that first time. Well, I, I think certainly there was a shock initially. 
but it was welcoming her with open arms. I remember the next day she was there because she didn't really have any clothes, taking her down to Jefferson City to the dress shop and uh, you know buying her underwear so she could try clothes on and trying to pick out some things to wear. And um, there, it's 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 not like she'd been broken. But it's like she'd realized there, there was a wall, and she wasn't sure where she wanted to be. And for the first time, she was really listening to our parents, and she worked to find a place for herself in what I think would be traditional society. She was going to marry a man that she'd been living with, even though she was putting her faith in someone who had kind of... Uh, spaced out on drugs and was in a mental hospital talking to aliens on a, a, you know, a radio. But you know, there, there was the fantasy within her that you know, she could be a solid, grounded person. And that year, that one year was so special because she was really a participating member. We went and watched Michael play Little League, and, you know, and she'd watch me in the marching band at, at high school, and, and, and we'd just be at the household cooking dinner and sewing clothes, and she and I would stand in front of the mirror and put our hair up and talk about you know, what worked and what didn't. So it, it was a, a really, a way to connect with the family in a way that she hadn't in a long time. And then, you know, she, she found out that Mr. Wonderful maybe wasn't quite that wonderful and that she had to decide if she wanted music instead. And friends and enticements and on a break from college, you know, she did the the, the funny story of the, her friend saying, well, I'll take you out to San Francisco, because she'd heard this band she liked. And he said, but you have to tell your parents. Mm -hmm. you know. And he, she said, sure. And so he drove her to the house, and she walks in and comes back and says, I told them, let's go. <laughs> well, she told them she was going to Austin. She, 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 got, she got the wrong state. <laughs> For the weekend, right? For the yeah, weekend. for the weekend. <laughs> Going to Austin for the weekend. Yeah, but by then my parents had, had learned to take Janice, you know, a, a little softly. You know, she'd be back. Right. And then, so now she goes back to San Francisco. Wait, can Francisco. we just talk about that part for a little bit more? Because that, for me, as the filmmaker, there's something I want to say. That, for me, the period of time when she was back at home was the ch most challenging part of the film for me, and I literally saved it for, for the end of the edit because it was so difficult because there were hundreds of pages of letters back and forth between Janice and Peter DeBlanc and I would cry when I would read these letters. They were so heartbreaking. She literally, want, she put everything she had into this relationship and he was just not responding to her and it was so obvious re knowing the story, you know, in hindsight, but it really was a challenge because you could almost make a whole movie about that chapter in her life because it represented her whole life in a weird way. Because another heartbreak. An another heartbreak, a yeah. compromise of who she was and what she wanted for a man because she was constantly struggling between the idea of having that conventional life and being who she wanted to be. And this person somehow represented both for her and it was really really challenging because I couldn't get enough of it into the story I couldn't I just couldn't figure out how to tell that part of the story but you know with the way Laura described it obviously that's that that's the best way to tell it which is how we did it in the film but we did use some of these letters they were so painful though to read um, and there was a period where I think didn't Peter's daughter try to sell these letters online or something. There was some... His ex-wife. His ex-wife. Yes. And we couldn't get any... We tried to get photos of Peter. We had, like, one photo from your house, which we were, we were... We used a couple times in the film, but I just remember there was this whole thing about that period of time that was... It was so important in a weird way to Janice's whole life, I guess, you know, this step back. Yeah. I think... I don't, I'm not sure you ever recover from really what it was a betrayal... Uh, an out and out betrayal and what I found bizarre because I found letters after she'd gone back to San Francisco <clears throat> that they had been back in touch 
and that he oh, wanted right. to get back together, right. and that um, he was, you know, saying, "Surely, you know, you you understand. You can understand how things were." And uh, it, it is. It has so many levels of sadness. But she definitely got the last laugh with that one for sure. She, I think, she blew him off at the end because I remember those. Yeah. He was writing right. at her in New York, and yeah. But I mean, this embarrassment in front of your parents was almost as big as the loss of with Peter because she was showing your mom and dad that she could get married. This man wanted to marry her because that was kind of her thing with every guy was, yeah, he wants to marry me, you know. And so here was this guy that was actually planning on marrying her and he completely you know abandoned her and it just seemed like she was so embarrassed about that well, he was living with another girl right, right. yeah and which is how pregnant? janice found out she picked up the phone to call peter and a, and a woman answered and and the thing that kept striking me watching the movie and i feel like i discovered janice in a whole new way through through you know amy's eyes in this film is just this really great free spirit, this artistic spirit, and someone who was, took, had beliefs and took a stand and just kept getting shattered and shattered and beaten down and heartbreak after heartbreak, and it, it just, it never stilled her, it never stopped her. Any one of those would have just completely emotionally shattered me, right? And she just kept walking through them time after time after time after time. Uh, and then she ends up in San Francisco, now for good, and one of the things that she wrote about in those letters is the, the freedom and the artistic expression and the people on the streets. And this is like 1965 San Francisco. This is the start of the whole People's Revolution, Haight-Ashbury, the psychedelic explosion, music, and San Francisco is definitely the center of the world at that point. Um, uh, really, if there's two points, it would have been swing in London and San Francisco. Oh, I think Janice yeah. uh, found her, her home of the heart in San Francisco, and it gave her a strength that she had never had before. And in, in some ways, I wonder if she didn't marry music, that that was the one thing that was so emotionally rewarding and uh, never let her down. And I think that that's part of the emotional commitment that you feel when she sang, is that she was connected to the bond of finding that emotion within herself to be able to sing like that. I also think she was, there's a great piece of film in the documentary uh, interview with Janice in San Francisco and, and she was talking about how she, at like 17, she discovered she could sing. She said, I opened my mouth and it just came out. And, and, and uh, she said, at the very tail end of the interview, she goes, it was surprising to say the least. <laughs> You know, and she gets to San Francisco, um, and there's a very famous uh, San Francisco poster artist, Stanley Mouse. And Mouse and Kelly were like the main progenitors of the Bill Graham San Francisco concert poster. And, and uh, she went to San Francisco ostensibly to audition for this new band that Chet Helms had called Big Brother and the Holding Company. And they lived at a house at 1090 Page Street, which is in the Haight. And, uh, she got there and Stanley was actually living in an apartment above the garage of that house and he was one of the first people to meet her in San Francisco and ended up, they were boyfriend and girlfriend for a while. And I got, I've heard, I heard so many great stories from Stanley about those early times. And, and one of the other interesting things for me in watching this film is you can, you start to see early footage of Janice singing with Big Brother and she's kinda just inward a little bit, you know, just hunched over a little bit, kind of a little shy and, She's playing, you know, a percussion instrument or an auto harp, and, and as time goes by, and I'm talking months, she starts to stand up straight, and this radiance starts to come out of her, and pretty soon she's at the front of this band, and then it's just, she opens her mouth, and everybody's on, just all hell breaks loose. That's right, and mo <laughs> the Monterey Pop footage, for me, from day one, was the most powerful footage. And it be, it's still in the movie for me, is that moment when Janice is, D.A. Pennebaker shot that amazing documentary, and he let's, literally- let's, let's talk about Monterey. How, you got, how many people here are familiar with the Monterey Pop Festival? Yeah, my people. I mean, that's such a good story, yeah. And it's interesting, I also, I managed Jefferson Airplane, and I was having these discussions with Grace Slick, and it occurred to me when we were uh, doing a panel, actually a few weeks ago, that she was one of the few artists I know that played Woodstock, Altamont, and Monterey. And I, I, and I asked her, I said, which one was 
the most important? She said, oh, Monterey Pop without question. She said, because that was an explosion. And if you think about it, I, want, I kinda wanna set the scene for this. So Monterey Pop is in June of 1967, the 50th anniversary is coming up next year. And that, that festival was the US and world breakout of Jimi Hendrix. It was the worldwide breakout of Otis Redding. It was the worldwide breakout of Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company. It was where Ravi Shankar was introduced to the world, where Hugh Masekela kind of crossed over into the rock jazz world, um, where the Who really broke through to the US for the first time. They were not that big of a band before that show. Um, and where you know, Hendrix famously lit, lit his guitar on fire and the Who destroyed their drums and Otis Redding blew the entire place away. And uh, what happened was, there was this, uh, I think it's worth getting through for a few minutes, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So Monterey Pop was organized by uh, Lou Adler, who was a Los Angeles manager and record label guy and uh, entrepreneur and impresario, and John Phillips, who was uh, one, of the, one of the lead singers of Mamas and Papas. Um, and they wanted to put together this festival and they reached out to another friend, Andrew Lou Goldham, and Andrew was managing the Rolling Stones. Um, and they were talking to the Rolling Stones, and uh, this, you, a lot of you may not under, realize, know this story, but um, originally the Beatles were gonna appear at Monterey, and they were all set. And, it was gonna, and they hadn't toured live, remember, in two years, and uh, Sgt. Pepper was out, and um, this was gonna be a, a, an amazing event, and at the last second, they couldn't go, and uh, the Beatles themselves drew this poster for Monterey. And I, I saw it at Lou Adler's house, and, it, it, and it, it had a little note, like, Dear Lou, so sorry we couldn't come. Here's a poster for the show. Love, John, Paul, George, and Harold. Um, and these guys from LA and Andrew from London had organized it, and the, the, the Northern California bands felt there was, there was a little... Um, there was a little bit of a war going on between L.A. and San Francisco. A little. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, having lived in both L.A. and San Francisco, I've experienced both sides of it. Um, but San Francisco, no question, was the heart of, of, of that exploding scene, and this was their turf, and Monterey is in their territory. And this is, you know, there were all kinds of little internecine warfares that went on. Um, just for an aside, not to veer too far, but uh, there was a very small club in San Francisco called The Matrix on Market Street. The capacity was about 65 people. But it was owned by Marty Ballon from the Jefferson Airplane and a couple other artists. And the artists in Northern California considered it their bar. And it was like, it was of the people. And they really resisted it and resented it when Bill Graham would bring in LA bands or other out of town bands. And so the unwritten rule in San Francisco was if you're an out of town band and you come in to play for Chet Helms or Bill Graham on your off night, you play at the Matrix for free. That was the tax. And there was a sound guy there named Peter Abrams and he recorded all these sets and Jimi Hendrix played there and Neil Young and The Doors and um, just amazing artists played there. It's kind of like their use tax. Um, so in Monterey, there was a big clash and at the very last second, during the first day of the festival, a lot of the Northern California bands said, fine, we'll come and we'll play for free because it was, it was a chari charitable event. Um, all the money was going to charity, and we'll come and we'll play, and you know and nobody's being exploited. And literally, right before they walked on stage, every band was presented with a release saying, "Oh, by the way, we're filming this, and by the way, you have to sign a release, and we own the film." And uh, and Big Brother and the Holding Company didn't want to sign it. In fact, they refused to sign it. And so uh, D. A. Pennebaker, who was directing the film, ordered all the cameras to be pointed down and turned off, which they were. And then... I'm still not sure about that. I think there's footage that we haven't found yet. I, I don't believe him. You're not, you're not a uh, documentary filmmaker by any chance, are you? I know, but I know there's some footage of them. In yeah, the odds form. are high that not all were pointed down, but that's the claim. Uh, anyway, so without being filmed, in quotes for you, Amy, um, Big Brother and the Holding Company walks on stage, and they launch into Ball and Chain, and the entire arena there is just absolutely floored. Um, and it's just this incendiary, unbelievable, heart-wrenching, dazzling performance that blows everybody away, and it wasn't filmed. 
And uh, Albert Grossman was there backstage, who managed Bob Dylan and Peter, Paul, and Mary, who was one of the big impresarios of the day. And uh, Lou Adler ran to Albert and said, Albert, you got to help. They, we got to film this. And, and we missed it. And uh, you got to get them to agree. And, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to give Big Brother and the Holding Company a second shot. We're going to put them on stage again the next day. Um, and we're gonna, they're the only band that's gonna have two performances, but you gotta get them to agree, and there was a lot of backstage drama, but eventually, thank God, they did. And so that performance that you see on film in Monterey Pop, and you'll see it in our documentary, was actually the second performance a day or two later. Uh, and again, completely incendiary, and I know that you and I share, I think all of us share a love for that one scene, mm -hmm. because the mamas and papas were organizers of this event, they were on the board of directors of this event, they were the reigning kings and queens of the Los Angeles music scene and early Laurel Canyon, and again, there was a lot of enmity between North and South, and uh, you watch um, Mama Cass, who's in the audience, mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, fine, show us what you got, and Janice does this ball and chain, and it, the camera pans back to Mama Cass Elliott, who's just going, <laughs> like completely blown away. Uh, one of my favorite shots. Yeah. And you actually interviewed uh, D.A. Pennebaker and he talked about that shot. Yeah, um, well it's, I mean, I think it's just so amazing because they were the only band that played two performances at Monterey Pop. This was the last, this was Sunday night, end of the festival, and I mean, I heard that they were kind of in street clothes in the first performance and then they got kind of all dolled up for the second one. I mean, that gold lame suit is, is famous. Her feet, her shoes, like just those every, kitten heels, those, yeah. I mean, everything about that footage is so amazing. But um, yeah, Penny had a really close relationship with Janice. He loved her and he was obviously very worried about her when she started getting into drugs and kind of they went astray. But he spent a lot of time with her and the band and just that moment was really important for Janice on so many levels because they had a really bad relationship with their manager at the time. I actually am spacing with their out their first on his manager, name. Julius, yeah. This, Julius Carpin, yeah. And so this is the point where Albert Grossman steps in. He's got his eyes on Janice, and the band is, they know that this guy Julius is a crook, but they also don't want to go with, you know, Grossman was very corporate at the time, and that wasn't like what they wanted to do. Right. But this moment you know, is, it's significant because after Monterey Pop, I don't think they ever were able to be equals. At, you know, Janice was, her, her star was rising, obviously, and she had just blown everybody away. And so it was kind of just a matter of time, the way the band guys describe it and John Byrne Cook. So um, it was just a momentous night for her, you know, yeah, you can see it. The, I'm sorry, those interviews with Big Brother, uh, Throughout the film, I think they, they, there was four or five different segments with uh, Dave and Peter, um, were really t and Sam, who sadly passed away like right after you interviewed him. That was really sad. Did you want to uh, mention something, Laura? Well, I I was just remembering that Janice kept a big scrapbook of letters and drawings and photos and a lot of clippings from newspapers, and she kept one from Monterey that that the headline read. Dream came true for Monterey, and Janice had written in ink, it sure did for me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and as she's finding her way, uh, Dave Getz, the drummer of Big Brother, um, I really love Dave, and we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about stuff, and, and I, I also manage the Otis Redding estate, and uh, Dave and I were talking one day, and he's like, well, you know, like, Janice was Otis Redding's biggest fan. I said, well, I knew she was really into him. He's like, no, you don't understand. He said, I went with her the first time she ever saw Otis. I said, well, you guys, I said, so what happened? You guys like knew he was coming to town? He's like, no, 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 no. He said, let me tell you what happened. He said, Janice had just gotten an apartment in the city with like a couple roommates and it was her first big girl apartment on her own. And we were all there on a Sunday night having this party, like a housewarming party. And it's probably 60 or 70 people in this like three bedroom apartment. And People are passing around this bottle of cold duck, and Janice keeps taking these huge swigs of cold duck. He said, and I kind of saw it out of the corner of my eye, and then I, like, it popped into my consciousness. It's like, Janice, what are you doing? She's like, what do you mean? I, I'm, I'm drinking. He's like, Janice, there's like 80 hits of LSD in that bottle. <laughs> 
She's like, what, 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 what? what? <laughs> she, <laughs> she freaked out, tried to puke in the bathroom, I guess couldn't, and then she is tripping balls. Uh, and Otis Redding was playing at the Fillmore that night. And what Bill Graham used to do is they would do two sets, right? Like a um, 7 and a 10 p.m. show or a 6 and a 9 p.m. show. And so she had never seen Otis Redding. And so Dave was trying to calm her down. And he was like, okay, Janice, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be right here with you. We're going we're gonna to go see Otis. She's like, yeah, Otis Redding. He's like, so I took Janice, who's like, you know, turning into Paisley fireballs. <laughs> And uh, they went to the Late Show on Sunday, and the Late Show on Sunday, there wasn't that many people there. Dave said there was like 100, 150 people there. So I took Janice in, and we just both sat down cross-legged on the floor, and Otis came out, and I watched Janice completely transform. Like, it was just the way she took it in. I, I, just, I was trying to think about, I, I actually had a not dissimilar experience, which is for another panel another time, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> then I really think Janice started to explode. And I, 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 just as a fan watching this um, completely unfettered, free explosion of input and creativity and talent and the people she was around. And can you imagine what it's like to be, you know, hanging out on a regular basis with your cohorts, the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane and the Charlatans and Moby Grape and Electric Flag and Credence. And I mean, it was quite a time. And there was some... You got some great interviews in there. Um, and, some and great footage of Otis. I mean, that was literally the most expensive footage in the movie, but it was You're so worth it. I know. I, you <laughs> would think we would have gotten a deal based on the joint manager, but um, that was a really fun scene to cut. They kept telling me to cut it shorter and shorter. I'm like, no, this is, this is a moment for her. And I, I think that, you know, everyone talked about Janice not doing hallucinogenics and she was she was definitely <laughs> well that that was like the division was like if you did LSD you probably didn't do heroin and like she was on the other side obviously so she didn't like those she didn't smoke pot she didn't do LSD that night obviously was, must have changed her mind about that but um well there, let me let me step in for one second okay. I, I have one of my professors in, in this business was Ray Manzarek from The Doors. And uh, I learned a lot from Ray over 15 years. And I got to know and spend a lot of time with Paul Kantner from Jefferson Airplane before he sadly passed away earlier this year. And they both told me uh, very similar things about similar topics. And one of the things they both agreed on, and it's an important point to note, um, is... <clears throat> They, people during that time, and especially the artists, and Ray always said to me, he goes, we didn't take acid to get high. Acid was not a getting high recreational drug experience. We took acid to get educated. We took acid to open our consciousness and open our minds. And I've talked to each of the members of The Doors, except for Jim, obviously, who I never met, and each one of them said, yeah, I don't regret it. I wouldn't change a thing, and it completely changed my consciousness. And when we were talking about that time in San Francisco, um, Paul Kentner said to me, he goes, wait, wait, wait. He goes, don't lump in acid with everything else. He said, acid was the dessert. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really telling comment. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, I, I think with, with drugs, I mean, Janice clearly got addicted to speed the first time she was in San Francisco and came home really to detox, among other things. Came back, started experimenting with different drugs. Right. But when you experiment with drugs to get high, that's one thing. And in, during, during that time and place, taking acid was a whole other thing, mm -hmm. right? So they're not really the same right. thing. And I mean, I think that David Niehaus really kind of sums that up nicely in the film because Janice, I mean, you're talking about how she was on stage and I think Janice just wanted to be normal after she got off stage. She wanted to be able to like just blend into the room and I think there was an expectation that she needed to be the Janice Joplin that was just performing. And I, I mean, Dave Getz said that she became a caricature of herself. And I think what he meant was that she didn't know how to not be Janice Joplin when she wasn't performing. And well, as so, humans, we tend to play so, up to people's expectations sometimes, right? right? So heroin was a, an easy thing for her to escape with. And um, that just, that was something that 
that the other Dave, Dave Niehaus said as well, he said that she, was, she felt everyone's pain so deeply that this was the only way that she knew how to check out. So it wasn't, she wasn't trying to expand her mind, obviously, she was trying to do the opposite and check out. Um, but just one other thing I wanted to say was that the guys in my interviewing process with the guys that did a lot of LSD, I always thought their minds were really sharp, but sharper than the other group of people that I interviewed. I mean, like, real, no, seriously, I think, I think that, you know, in their 70s, they were, st they were pretty sharp. It's so, interesting that you say that because two of the sharpest, most educated, um, quickest, do most LSD. concise guys <laughs> I've ever met wait, 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 were Ray Manzarek and Paul Kantner. Okay. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And Bob Weir. Amazing. Like, oh, that I mean, story about <laughs> Janice had a relationship with Pigpen, who was the keyboard player, the original mm -hmm. player for the Dead, and the Dead all famously lived together in a house in the Hate, as many as, as the airplane did, and as Big Brother did. And Bob was talking about. Uh, he goes, "Yeah, we all love Janice." He said, "But you know, it's like she would come over, and the walls were pretty thin." <laughs> and he goes, "And all night long, we'd hear this, Daddy, 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 Daddy." <laughs> Just to watch Bob Weir doing a Janis so Joplin great. impression, uh, that yeah. was a moment. Yeah, but I mean, he's really sharp, Bob yeah. Weir. He's a, he's a really smart guy. A lot of these I guys. And the other him. thing I, I, um, I kind of want to jump to, and we'll come back, I want to talk a little bit about David Niehaus and that relationship. And I don't know, we've actually never talked about it much. I don't know how much you guys knew about David Niehaus before the fact. I, I knew very little. But I remember one of the things that you and I, Amy, were talking about is, uh, is David, w w we knew that Janice had had a relationship with this guy, David, and nobody ever knew whatever happened to him. And then Amy called me one day and she said, I found him. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh yeah, he's alive, he's well, he's in Hawaii. I'm flying out to see him. Yeah. And, and, and you had a background before you started making uh, feature films and documentaries. I think you were an investigative reporter or something, weren't you? What did, what did you do? Well, I did long form reports for CBS News and CNN special investigations. I'm, I'm definitely good at finding people. I know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Getting backgrounds on people. Yeah, it was really exciting to find him. He was in Hawaii and he hadn't spoken to anyone before, um, like film wise. I think he spoke to you on the phone when you were writing your book. Yeah, um, I, I talked with him. But he was, I think there was, um, he had so much love. He, ha he, was ma he is married to a surgeon and has this whole other life. And I think he was very protective of his family because this was kind of like his lost love. So um, it took a while, but he came out and we went there. And uh, he, I still stay in touch with him. He's, he's in this poker club with Willie Nelson and Woody Harrelson and um, Owen Wilson and Chris Christopherson. He's always inviting me to come out there and, and film them because it, apparently it's That'd like the, I know, I, th I think <laughs> right. I should do it. Yeah. Um, it would be a lot lighter than the other films I work on. It was on, also so. an amazing interview that you had with Chris Christopherson. Oh, I know. In that oh film. my God, that's such a moment. That was beautiful. I mean, he, that moment, actually that interview took place in a restaurant here in Los Angeles because we had uh, dedicated the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for Janice. Yeah. And we had asked Clive Davis to come and Chris Christopherson to come. And why did it take so many years for Janice to get that star? That was so crazy. Wasn't it like 43 years? Uh, I don't know. I'll let you know when Jim Morrison gets one. What? <laughs> I will let you know when Jim Morrison gets one. Oh. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy, especially posthumously. But we had brought these guys out, and I thought it was a really beautiful dedication. And, and we were all hanging out there. And right before the thing was going to start, I was talking to Chris back in that green room, and he said to me, I think you guys were there too, we were talking, and he said, yeah, he said, because he was very close to Janice, and he said, when Janice died, it just, it just, it shattered all of us. It just took the wind out of our sails. And he said, I was so distraught, I, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So finally, I, I just realized I have to do what songwriters do and I wrote a song about it. Mm -hmm. He said, and, and I've never been able to publicly perform the song. And I, I think I'm gonna try it today. Mm -hmm. and, and he got up and he started to play the song and he made it through the first verse and chorus and he just broke down and had to stop. And we all went to lunch right after that with Clive and Chris and, and then Amy came and kind of pulled Chris away and did the interview right in a quiet part of the restaurant. So it was a, it was a really heavy time and I think 
you got some real emotional truth there. And I would like to go back to David for a minute because I, I want to share with all of them the story of David Niehaus because it's a real linchpin, I think, of this film and certainly really informed me and gave me a whole different viewpoint of Janice and, 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 and what did happen and what could have happened. So maybe you can take us through that story. Um, okay, well, um, after Wood... Oh, God, no, I'm getting... Um, well, sorry, she was... Wood, she was. Uh, let me start it out for when you. When she goes to Rio, is right after Woodstock? Yeah, she so was getting ready to record yeah. Pearl okay, yeah, in so Los she Angeles. Went, right. And she had just had a bad run at Woodstock. Right after Woodstock, she was kind of... She had hit a low. She, Big Brother had broken up, and then her next band broke up, and she was... She wanted to go clean up in Rio, and so she goes to to Carnival, which is not exactly the place to clean up. But I by, mean, by why herself. not? If it's Janice. By herself, there's no. No, such no, thing Linda. As Linda went yeah. with her. What's that? Linda Gravenita. Oh right, went Linda with went. Her. But Linda yeah, wasn't there the whole time. No, she left early. So Janice is on the beach in Ipanema, this like this little bikini with like hands on her breasts and her butt. That I think Linda had sewn the the bikini together and. And David comes up and he meets the girl from Ipanema, who, who's Janice. He doesn't know she's Janice Joplin. And they fall in love. And after their first night, she tells him that she's detoxing. And he stays with her for a few days when she's just, you know, sweating in his arms. And she gives up drugs. And he doesn't really know who she is. He, he has no awareness of Janice well, Joplin. He's well, been no, like this he world traveler. he didn't know she was Janice Joplin. He knew who Janice Joplin was, but he didn't realize she was Janice Joplin. Maybe he hadn't seen her face or whatever. But they ended up falling in love, and then after she got clean, they went to the Amazon and spent, I mean, she ended up staying for like a month, and they, she was happy, she was sober, she was just like, she was in love, but she was, it was just like this beautiful time for Janice. And, and, and he then, was a really good guy. He was a mountain he, man, he had been a world traveler, he, he was a climber, he was just this big, burly, smart man that was perfect for her in so many ways. And, um, so then he decides to give up his world journey and go to San Francisco with her, and they go to the border. And his visa paperwork was not in order, so he had to stay behind. So she was due to meet him in San Francisco in a couple days, and she got back, and she met up with Peggy Casertis and got back into heroin within 48 hours, and he got there, and it was just very difficult. But he stayed. He ended up staying for a few months, and, and they were happy and working through things. But he, wasn't, he didn't fit in perfectly with, with her group, I guess. And so I think there was a little bit of turmoil in the group. But anyway, she, she was in and out of drugs, and she wasn't ready, I guess. For the commitment at that time, and so he decided to move on, and then, um, and then she eventually got herself clean after going through a number of big emotional moments, including her high school reunion, which I'm sure we'll talk about in more detail a little later. But anyhow, they started writing again, and they were going they were going to meet up in October when she was finished with this album, and it just it was really sad. It didn't happen, so. No, she, she passed away in her hotel room mm -hmm. during the recording of that album. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you discovered there was an, a, a letter there. Yeah, she didn't receive the telegram where he was telling her where to meet him and when. It was, yeah. One yeah. of those w moments where you think, like, what if she would have received that telegram that night? Maybe she wouldn't have. We, she know. discovered it was unopened behind the front desk. Mm -hmm. Janice had never received it mm -hmm. uh, and passed away. Still, it still affects you, doesn't it? Yeah. Me too. Um, so during this time, Janice is having some turmoil. She's also having tons of success. She's a worldwide icon by this point. Um, she does several appearances on the Dick Cavett show. We learn a little bit about Dick Cavett during in your <laughs> film. <laughs> that was a great scene. I want to. I, I want to hear it through, through from through your eyes because I want to know. I want to know how that happened. Um. That interview with Dick. Okay, well, I'm convinced. I just saw Dick a few weeks ago, and I'm even more convinced that they slept together again. I was like, <laughs> I cornered him again. Um, well, Dick Cavett was so cool at the time, right? I mean, he had all the best interviews. Yeah. And Janice, I, I feel like these, all these guys, she just wanted to do something for them in a way. Like, she went on his show four times in a year. I mean, that's kind of crazy. She was, she was so generous with herself. And I even feel like the... The, um, 
me and Bobby McGee was for Chris Christopherson more than it was for her. You know, she wanted to break people's careers. She wanted to give them a break. She wanted to help everyone. So anyway, Dick and Janice um, clearly had a great energy with each other on the show. And he, you know, he interviewed her numerous times. Um, and they would go out afterwards and hang out. And, you know, they, they had fun. They enjoyed each other's company. And so, you know, he really still feels it. You can see it, you know, you can see it. Yeah, but you family. asked the question during the interview. Well, yeah, I asked the questions. I mean, he's kind of, I mean, he kind of admitted it on camera. He definitely admitted it off camera. They were, de they were having an affair. I, okay, I heard, <laughs> I heard some things about it, but I'm not going to say them um, publicly. Oh, come on, so. don't be No, quiet. no, I'm not, I'm not saying them, but he, definitely they had a little thing, for sure. What kind of things have you heard that you're not saying that I can't, we can't say? I would not, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. It, wouldn't, it would be hurtful to somebody, so I'm not going to okay. do that. But, I, but they had a nice little thing. They had a cute moment. No, it was and great. The way he was on camera during your interview yeah. was just like, whoa. <laughs> it was so great. And then when we did the, um, the screening in New York, do you guys remember that? When he came running up and jumped on the stage? It was like, he's, he's so cute. I love Dick Cabot. He's great, yeah. Yeah, we did an event with Dick and with Clive and... Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Clive was great. Um, so on one of those Dick Cavett show appearances, she talks about how uh, she's gonna go home for her 15th high school or her 10th anniversary high school reunion. Um, now she's a huge star all over the world. She's wearing the feather boas in her hair and she's going home to Port Arthur. And that's how these guys found out about it, by the way. So <laughs> cool. So tell me about that. I, Michael, Laura, take us through it. Uh, well, like they said, uh, we heard about it on TV that she was coming <laughs> home. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the parents were like, well, <laughs> I mean, do I want to get into context? Or, uh, I mean, Janice had been ragging on Port Arthur a lot. And so our parents were a little perturbed because this was our home. She, she had ragged on Port Arthur? Ragged on Port yeah. Arthur. She had... Uh, Those people back there really yeah, put they, me I'll, down. I'll, yeah, they... Well, it was true, wasn't it? Yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, she had done it, and uh, that had been hard for our parents because they, and us, because we still lived there. Uh, <laughs> so, they were, and rightfully so, our parents were concerned. Looking back on it is one thing. Being happening at the time, I remember everybody was excited, but with trepidation. And uh, when she came with a, an entourage, she came with a black gentleman, uh, Snooky Flowers, which was also like, oh my God, you know. And, uh, well, as Laura pointed out in the film, when you guys were growing up, there was an active KKK chapter in oh, Port yeah. Arthur, Texas. Absolutely, oh. absolutely. And he was playing in those clubs. Mm -hmm. And like right. had they had to put a curtain in front of them because they were black. But he, your parents probably saw him play. That's possible. I mean, yeah, that's it's right. It's incredible. Yeah. He was around the area. Hmm. I don't think our parents. Uh, yeah, our parents. <laughs> <laughs> that's when, sound, when, they young, when they were right. young. When they were young, they, they did. Young. When but they were young, then, they didn't did. they used to go to those uh, clubs but they as were. well? Yes, yeah. they went to They're, the state line clubs yeah. and everything. Yeah. 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 Until until your mom got pregnant, they were. Dancing on the tables and stuff. Were they? Were they were having a good we're time? We're talk about. That. Oh come on! This, come on. My mother was known to dance on the tables. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you know the the stories I heard from them is that uh, once they decided to have a family, uh, that all of those things were behind them. Right. That's what they said. No and more drinking. On your seatbelt. Right. Right. And I think it was behind mother. <laughs> by, by the way, I do want to cut in for one second in this story and insert another story because I think it will inform a little bit. Uh, I, tell me about, this, this is such a great montage in the film, about when you guys and your parents came to San Francisco to see uh, Janice for so the, and yeah. visit Janice in the city. And now she's a big star. But it's early. In San Francisco? Yeah. No, she... She was a big star in San Francisco. Wait, how old were you, though, Michael? I was in high school. So. You were like 16 or like... 14, 15, okay, something like that. I love your telling of yeah, this story. Yeah, I just graduated. Okay. Yeah, that... Uh, we went to... Laura and I joked that we we're the only people that took our parents to the Avalon Ballroom. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, Janice uh, wanted to perform for the parents to show off. And uh, so she got the big brother to do a talk to Chet Helms and got uh, 
uh, I think it was Moby Grape to give up one of their sets so that they could play that night. And uh, we walked into the Avalon Ballroom. And I remember, I'm like a wannabe hippie, really bad, you know, and because um, my older sister's so cool. And uh, I'm walking up the stairs, and uh, Chet Helms is, I'm behind, I was last, and uh, there was this tall, skinny guy, Chet Helms. If you don't know who Chet Helms is, Wikipedia him. Uh, he's the father of the Summer of Love. Uh, yeah, the two main promoters in San Francisco that really helped for, create the scene were Bill Graham, who had Winterland Productions, and Chet Helms, who had the family dog. It's sort of the other way around. Chet Helms is first, yeah. always. So I, but you, Chet Helms has started it. Bill Graham and came in and monetized it. he was from Austin. Yeah. He was a Texan, Texan from that group right. she knew yeah. in Austin, she, Texas. He had seen her to come out for Big Brother and all. So... Chet's a very big part of Janus as well as San Francisco scene. But this guy had long hair, and nobody even at that time had really long hair because it was still early. The guys were just starting to grow long hair, and it was like, like there. And my parents were freaking out. <laughs> uh, I was freaking out. And uh, the, we got into the green room, and I'm hanging out with Moby Grape and and I got to do the lights at the Avalon Ballroom, and then Janice got up and did a set with Big Brother, and I just remember sitting there, Janice totally in her realm, you know, proud, totally proud to show up for the parents. And confident. And, and confident, everything. She, they're up there rocking and rolling, and the, the, it wasn't a very big venue or anything, maybe this big, you know? A uh, couple hundred people, maybe, but. It was such a wonderful evening, and my parent, your story, of, I didn't hear the pop say that, but... Oh, yeah, no, I want to hear about yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, at the, the very end of the evening, we went out a uh, back door, and it had a long, narrow staircase. And I remember hearing one of my parents say to the other one that, you know, dear... I don't think we're going to have much influence anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was true. That was true. Right. That was true. Right. But I have a question for you, actually, just about that night, something I never mm. asked you. Because uh, Michael actually was planning on going on the road with Janice when he graduated high school, um, yeah. something I discovered when we interviewed. But how much did that night and that performance kind of impact you wanting to you know, jump into the scene? <laughs> uh, immeasurably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I want, it's, it's weird to say, but I wanted to be just like her. You know, you usually don't want to be like your older sister. Uh, if you have one, it's an odd sentence, but I wanted to be just like that and that freedom. Uh, after she passed, one, uh, we were a lot alike. Uh, we were a lot alike. And, uh, she was very protective of me, and I've always felt that way. You know, that I'm going to segue. Can I segue? Sure. Or uh, everybody here has said all the guys were very protective of Janice, and that's something that Laura and I really learned over the years. That we're not asking anybody to do anything, but they cover her. You know, they are there for her. Fifty years later, they're there for. It's amazing how these guys and women, but the people involved at that time, they do this rally around her. It's so touching. You know, I could talk to anybody and they, oh, love you. You know, they just want to protect. And so, but uh, Janice had, uh, before Port Arthur, we're sure she'd come back for the reunion. She had made a will out, which was weird for a hippie 26 year old to do. Not anyway. if you were managed by Albert Grossman. Well, that's true. Work. You're probably right. right. <laughs> Good point. Right. Uh, valid. She had an attorney guy, you know, but uh, uh, she had made the will out to me only. And that was always so like, oh, wow. But then when she came back for Port Arthur, she had kind of made some mental mm -hmm. uh, peace yeah. with the parents and, uh, and changed her will after that. And, uh, you know, it was just, yeah. I've loved that little something happened for her there that day you know i mean yeah it sounds a, like she made peace maturity. with herself almost. you got to remember she was what 25 yeah. 26 you know like a, a young person yeah coming one, into their own and one of the more emotional um parts of the interview i did with you which i didn't get into the film um 
I always wanted to was your story about um, finding out, because you were still in high school and you were still in Port Arthur, and so I, I don't know if you want to, do you mind talking about that tonight? How I found out. Just this, sure. yeah, walk uh, us through. Is that okay that we're jumping ahead, Jeff? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, well, it's, I woke up when well, my father opened up the bedroom door and uh, all he could get out was he said, you know, he woke me up and he said, uh, your sister's dead. And, you know, he turned out, walked out of the room. Now, as a parent, I can't imagine even getting that sentence out, you know, um, how hard that must have been for him. And everything changed. And I wanted to go, like, talk to somebody or what, you know, who do I talk to? And I went to school that morning, and uh, everybody already knew, though. You know, it was sort of like it was on the news, and I was, that was the first time what it became realer that day that, uh, well, that how big she was, and that I didn't have anybody to talk to about this. You know, it was so awkward. And weren't you getting calls, in, like, from news people? Uh, yeah, the, the, well, uh, Laura was away at college. And uh, so she was older and mature, and uh, <laughs> you know, like 21. You know, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> ancient. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but the parents went to California to deal with her demise, and uh, they left me at home. And uh, you know, none of us knew anything about fame or anything. We we're a little podunk town, and. Uh, the phone started ringing like crazy, and I'm like answering. Kips, I, I think it's my parents tell me what's going on, you know, over and over. And I'm like, "Hello, this is Walter Cronkite," you know. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's like, you know, I mean, I've got everybody I've ever heard of. I just kind of hung up on everybody though, and uh, uh, I hung up on Walter Cronkite. My <laughs> <laughs> claim to fame. No, right? Yeah, that's what about, about it. Laura? What about you when you were at college? Could you? Well, uh, some ways similar. I, I was sound asleep, and the phone rang, and Pop said, you know, Janice is dead. And I said, no, you know, and he, he said, yes, she's dead. And hung up, and, you know, I was not he awake. You just hung up after that? Well, we hung up. I mean, he didn't hang up on me or anything. We just hung up. There wasn't anything to say, you know, and... Uh, you know, he said he when he knew more, he'd let me know. But my roommate came in, and, and I told her, and, and she brought me a glass of water and two aspirin, which I, I, to this day, I, I think that that's touching and so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I probably could have used a hug. But I, I was on break in grad school, and I... Um, I spent most of the time, I guess I tried, well, I actually went to grad school, and there were people all in the halls with newspapers talking about her death. And I've, I've never felt so, you know, nakedly robbed because what was private and personal, always had been, was now public. And that was like a huge education that we had to learn about this. She was a public person, and it, it was public grief. And I, I think I spent the next couple of weeks making uh, date nut bread uh, <laughs> and eating date nut bread. Uh, Michael didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. The parents, when they got out to L.A., found out that she was to be cremated because they wanted to bring her body home and have a service. Um, but they couldn't and they didn't, they wanted to keep Michael and I away from the puddle blue of her death. But what they did is they left us both isolated and lost, really. So it was, it was tough and uh, when I, w I went home. They didn't know better. They I didn't mean, know any you know, better, yeah. no. I, I went home at Christmas. The house was so heavy. It was so heavy. It, they couldn't talk. We didn't know how to process. And they weren't religious. There was no pastor to talk to. You know, there. Uh, so I, I went back to my apartment and made more date nut bread. <laughs> and 
It took a long time, I think, a long time before uh, we were ever able to deal much by talking with the grief. And in, and in many ways, I think I, I wrote about it what, many, many years later, partly just because we never talked about anything. And I wanted to know. Well, that whole time, it was so public, it was uh, hard to, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't like have our own private opinion almost about the loss of a family member. Usually when somebody dies, they go away. Mm -hmm. And you remember beautiful times, but this was like, well, besides it's sudden that it was so public and I couldn't yeah. tell anybody and now and they would tell me all people would tell me what happened I'm like who the, are you to tell me what's happening and you're wrong by the way but uh, you know right. trying to tell them they were wrong was sort of immaterial also right. must have been a very strange feeling uh, well there's that footage that exists of your mom I think is yeah. very revealing yeah. footage it's it's the only footage I found of Oh your reading mom. the letters reading she's, the letters condolence letters from fans It's very yeah. emotional you can see that she's kind of loving uh, her daughter through her the fan letters and yeah. she, you could see that she was saying things about Janice that she never got to say to her directly and that's what it felt like you know and That's she's, really she's interesting holding it together barely, barely. really yeah oh. However, there was one very uh, Janus moment after her <laughs> passing, when, and I want you, I've always wanted to hear this story, and to this day I have not heard it, so you guys are going to tell it. The memorial. Um, which is what Janus left in her will to be done, and what happened. Because <laughs> there was very few people there, and you were two of them, right? Or was it, no, was you, Laura. Laura. Yeah, they wouldn't let me go to that. Well, she left $5,000 to have a party thrown. Evidently, a, a friend of hers had uh, died and they'd thrown a party and she thought that's the way to die, have a party. And so they had this celebration and I uh, was invited and I said yes. I, I'd never been on an airplane before and so I booked a flight out. <laughs> I booked first class because I didn't know the difference. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what of you say course. now. <laughs> well, believe me, they booked the return and it wasn't first class. But um, I went out and met these people I'd never met. John Cook, Janice's Road Manor, was driving me around and talking to me and, and pointing out the ocean and, and her house and and the, these people, uh, and Albert Grossman was there, and in my, uh, there was music playing, there was a, a big tie-dyed satin sheet up on the wall with a rip in it, you know, uh, which was symbol a symbolism of Janice really liking sex, and you know, I mean, it was just- It was a bar, it was at a bar in Sausalito, correct? Uh, it, it, yeah, could have been in a bar. I, I just remember the room. And, and I remember that I had flown out from Texas and had not had dinner, and they offered me a brownie. <laughs> <laughs> and wackiness ensues. So I, I had a couple. <laughs> and um, that, that's when uh, John Cook uh, brought me home uh, <clears throat> after throwing up on his boots. <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, and I, you know, I slept in her house and I just got to be there. It was, I'm so glad I went. And it, and it was an awkward thing that Tanae just amplifies really the reality of the separation in our lives. Um, it, it was wonderful to have been in her house, to be around her people, to be at the party. And uh, it was wonderful to be able to pet her dogs because she loved dogs. And I remember uh, the animals a lot. And it, it was good to go home. But didn't you describe it as like they were, you felt like they were eating her flesh or like you, the party? You said they were like passing meat around and you felt like these, uh, was there, were there two parties? <laughs> Well, was this there, is two brownies in, right? Two brownies. Yeah. Um, was there a second party? There, didn't you you describe something at Golden Gate Park, or am I getting this completely? I, I think the Golden Gate Park was the the party for Chocolate George. I think that she was oh. copying, and uh, oh. so maybe that was some sort of ritualistic bread and wine thing that was brownie. I don't. I don't. 
I don't know. It's the brownies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the brownies. Well, I, I, I do have to say, and I want to jump in for a second, that having dealt with a lot of, you know, legacy artists and estates and beneficiaries, um, you guys have done such an amazing job, I really have to say it, of keeping her legacy alive and relevant and authentic, and you've made a series of really great decisions, it seems like, over the last few decades, um, which is a rare thing to see, and I've seen a lot, um, and I think you've done great honor to your sister, and I, I thank you because this is how I got exposed to the, the real inners of her legacy, and I think getting to know her as a woman through the things you guys have done has really made me a much better man. And, and thank you, Amy, for continuing their vision and legacy and making this amazing film. And thank all you guys for coming and listening to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.